everyone, I am Rebecca from ChemBits, and today we are going to dye some roving. And I'm going to do something that I'm not sure if I've ever done before. And I'm going to dye two different types of fiber side by side to just see what kinds of differences we can see. This is something I do all the time with yarn, but I don't think I've done this with roving before. Before we go further, I want to give a huge shout out and thank you to today's lab partner, Stephanie Groos. Stephanie, thank you so much for being my lab partner. And I'm really excited to see how this fiber comes out and to send you something really exciting to spin with. If you at home want to learn more about how you can become a lab partner, go and check out the listings in the Chemnitz Creations Etsy shop. The first roving is Wool of the Andes roving. I have dyed this one probably more than anything else, and it is just 100% Peruvian Highland wool. Gloss roving is 70% merino wool, 30% silk. So it is not only a different type of wool, but also it has the silk in there. So it has a sheen to it and will absorb color differently. Since neither of these are superwash, they will both absorb color slower than yarn might. And as roving, colors will go further because without the twist, there's not resist within the fiber itself. My hypothesis is that Overall, the gloss might absorb color a little bit slower. Maybe things will spread a little more and blend a little more, but I don't think the difference is gonna be that extreme or extreme enough that I can't account it to the fiber types. I might think maybe I poured or applied the colors slightly differently, but I still think it's worth trying out, and so I'm excited to see the results. I haven't quite decided how I am going to dye things in the respect that I don't yet know if I am going to dye this with dry dye powder or with liquid dyes. I think that we will make that up a little bit as we go along. I am going to try to dye this all in one pan, which I don't know if it's gonna end up feeling a little crowded or not. But what I do know is that I want to apply the dye to the fiber while the fiber is cold. And I'm gonna do that so I feel a little bit more comfortable manipulating it, potentially flipping it in the pan, or at least, you know, checking to see how the coverage is. So I now need to start adding some liquid to pre-soak it. I'm coming in with a jar of eight cups of water plus four tablespoons of white vinegar. And I've poured a little over half on. Now, it's gonna take a little bit of time for this to soak up fiber. Both of these don't soak up liquid nearly as quickly as, say, their spun counterparts. And I'm not quite sure how long I'm gonna let them soak. Certainly, I want the silk to feel like it is well saturated. I mean, I want both, but the silk will probably take more time. I'm adding the rest of the liquid in because I'm finding that the fiber is sort of soaking up the liquid and we may end up adding more liquid once we go to heat things, even though you can see as I press, there's plenty of liquid, but we absolutely have our fiber at the surface. So I think we're in reasonable shape if I want to try to use either dry powder or if I want to use something else. I'm now gonna let this sit for 30 minutes to an hour. Uh, and we, I will come and like press every so often to try to remove air. What I'm trying to do is just press and not rub. I don't wanna rub and agitate the fiber but I do want to help press the water in. And I can tell that, at least with the gloss over here, that there is a lot of dryness in there. So maybe after 30 minutes or so, we'll add more liquid. We'll see. I know Stephanie likes a combination of pink and green. And since we just had a blizzard and I'm really wanting some spring, this felt perfect for me today. I have picked two colors that are more pastel leaning. I would say pistachio is really not very pigmented at all, but gives a beautiful 
pistachio green. Valentine Blush is a lovely color. It's not super bright. It's a bit more of a muted pink, but it's beautiful for the springy floral feeling in my head. Moss Green, I think, breaks a little bit brown, which I think will work really nicely with these other two colors. And so I think I want to get started using these in dry powder form and seeing how they spread and play. I'm tempted to start with like pink mostly on one half, pistachio mostly on one half, and then maybe pops of moss throughout. Uh, the moss I am expecting to be the most pigmented of the colors, but yeah, we'll see. If I'm not liking what the colors are doing, certainly we will be adding more water at some point, but if I don't like the way the colors are behaving with the using the powder, then I can switch to dissolving them in some liquid and go with that. But I think I'm very inspired with this direction right now. I may not need a yarn mop today, but there's a chance I'm gonna want some yarn to wipe my gloves onto. So, since we've got Wool of the Indies roving, why not use a skein of Wool of the Indies worsted as a yarn mop? Normally I use a superwash skein like Snip Pick Stroll or Swish uh, too as my yarn mops, because the colors strike pretty quickly. But yeah, what, what would happen if I do my yarn moppy thing on a non-superwash yarn? So I am soaking uh, just briefly, the skein of Wool of the Andes and eight cups of water with four tablespoons of white vinegar. The same proportion I have here, and I can take liquid from here and put it in there when I need to. But I'm gonna let this soak for a couple of minutes and then we'll get started. I am wearing my respirator mask, safety glasses, and gloves because we're dealing with dry dye powders. And I think I wanna start with the pistachio. I have looked at this at a 1% depth of shade or one gram of dye per 100 grams of yarn just once. And I was surprised how it wasn't very pigmented, but not only that was it not very pigmented, it was, I mean, I guess this paint swap chip kind of thing looks pastel, but I was expecting this to be not very pigmented as well. Oh, funny, my quick wipe of the pistachio onto this yarn from my gloves makes it look a lot more yellow than I think what I was expecting. I do want my fingers to be dry before I go back into colors because I don't want to introduce moisture into these containers. I did do the pistachio first because I know it's less pigmented and I wanted to get a sense of how much of it I might need. And I'm sort of reserving some judgment on those two ends once I see where we go. But I think you can see that from a similar sprinkling of pink, the pink is a lot more intense relatively. And here as well, the pink versus the pistachio. Eventually, I am going to come and press things with a spoon or something to help the color spread out. It looks like I'm speckling, but I am sort of lightly applying the dye because I don't really want clumps that won't dissolve well. But I am curious. So I'm gonna add some pops of moss and maybe a couple pops over here by itself. Just for now, just to get an initial impression. If the pistachio doesn't end up doing what I want, then I think the moss will. And we could have less of the pistachio and just let that be some undertones and let the moss steal the show a little bit. I'm okay with either, but at this stage, we have these dyes just here on the fiber. Already on both fiber types, uh, down here is the little of the Andes and up here you just see a little bit of the gloss. But already you can see the colors spreading and sinking into the yarn. Uh, there's a lot of spread going on and I was just curious to see what we see if we let this wait and let these dyes really soak in. So I think I'm gonna wait 10 minutes 
just because I'm curious if things are gonna look substantially different from how they look now. I will say it looks like the pistachio breaks. I know the moss breaks, but it looks like the pistachio breaks from the spec colors I see in there, but I don't know for sure because I don't know if some of that could be some of the moss, even though I don't think I put the moss really in this region right here. So anyway, I'll be back in 10 minutes. Preliminary results here are very interesting. You can see that the pink has really blowed out, that the color has spread a fair amount. And the hues, it's looking softer on the Will of the Andes than it is on the gloss, where I do see more definition of the speckles. So maybe my original hypothesis was wrong, but I will say that Wool of the Andes does soak up water better than a silk blend, which usually needs more time potentially. So that could be coming into play, but I don't know, both are exciting. And then the pistachio, the pistachio is cool. It's a little bit more brown than say the moss, which is a bit of a brighter green. So I think I might intersperse the pistachio with the moss. The pistachio doesn't seem to be spreading. It doesn't seem to be really pigmented, but I do think I might put some of it a little bit all over-ish um, because it's not spreading very much and I think it looks kind of cool. So let's carry on. Okay, coming back with our pink and sort of layering it over here. Again, I am planning on pressing these colors down. I suppose I could have looked already to see how far they are penetrating into the fiber so far, but not a big deal. But you could see even spread out the difference from when we first added it to them having waited 10 minutes. But I am gonna go ahead and layer more of this pink over in these areas as well. And who knows, I may stop doing some of the pistachio uh, once we like flip to add more color. Uh, that is absolutely a choice that I may make. But for now, we'll add some. Because the thing with roving that is fun, ooh, I still want to do, I had a request once to do uh, to dye some roving and then flip it and dye the other side another color, which Rebecca, you need to make a note of that because that would be really, really fun. I didn't add much of it over here, but I did add some just because I think that it would be fun. I'm not intentionally adding any pink over here I don't think we really need it, but I'm curious to know if you would have brought some pops of pink down here or not. And again, with that, maybe when flipping it, I may change my mind. So we'll see how things go. But I'm now layering the moss on top of the pistachio which will definitely bring some more dimension into our green section. And while we're over here, just adding some pops of it on with our pink. Even though this is sort of like a reverse of what you might think for a floral, you might think like the pops of pink around the green, but yeah, I am intrigued. And then fun thing about spinning, is that this could be spun up in a variegated, repeating kind of colorway, or it could be spun up in, you know, using all the pink on one side and do just a pink yarn and then just the green and ply those together. That would also be really fun. Now, I'm actually going to gently, with a spoon, press down. And the goal is not to get everything like super evenly mixed. But the goal is to allow these colors to spread a bit. And I'm really using the dry powders as a delivery mechanism. And I was very, very curious to see how much they would spread without my assistance. 
it does look like overall the greens are spreading a lot more than the pinks but I like where this is going now if I peek see we still have a lot of white I'd expect on both yeah a lot of white in both kinds of sections I do want to make sure that I am satisfied with the color that we have already because I know if we end up with some white left over it will the, the whites that we have left over will make things more pastel overall. So before flipping, I'm just doing another layer of some pink, plus another little layer of some moss. But I don't think I'm gonna press this down yet because I think that there's going to be time for that and that it might do a little bit of that as we attempt to flip things without causing problems. <laughs> and we don't have a ton of color on our yarn mop right now. If I need to, I'll just directly add dye to it later. But let's try to flip the yarn. The problem is I don't really know. where okay i think that goes over there where one ends and so the way i'm flipping it we absolutely may get some spread and change see now i'm going to press and so some of those colors we just added have now that chance to move and spread. Cool. Yeah, now we just need to keep dying. I am still pretty impressed that my hypothesis was wrong. I'm seeing these colors spread so much more from the wool of the Andes, which is still towards the bottom of the screen, versus the gloss. Even immediately after that flip, we see so much more color after that press in the wool of the Andes. So I'm expecting our silk is gonna have a lot more white left in there, just because I am treating these the same way. And if they were both spun up side by side, there might be a lot of similarities in there because the bright colors we're seeing in the gloss may spread out a little bit more and then blend with some of the lighter patches that we have in the fiber, but I don't mind. I'm I, this is why I do things side by side. And this is why you make a hypothesis, because you could be wrong, and that's okay. That's okay. And so this is telling me more about how I may want to play with these going forward to get the kind of effect that I want. And of course, since we haven't started applying any heat yet, things may end up spreading a lot more on both, but I am just very excited with where we are. All right, the last little press I did after exposing some areas of white on the gloss uh, really did move the color through. So I did one more layer of some speckles and now I'm gonna take this to the stove where we're gonna start heating it up. That heat is on low currently. We're gonna go over and add water uh, pretty quickly. But I also am gonna set up a steamer basket to steam set our yarn mop for 30 minutes. As far as yarn mops go, Wool, uh, non superwash wool isn't the best choice because the colors don't sink in and strike as fast as they would with acid and no heat. So as I would move dye through, I would get more dye off of this back onto my gloves, which in the big grand scheme of things is not very bad, but when I want my hands to clean off, it's not the easiest choice, but I think this colorway is amazing. Okay, here we are at the stove. And we're starting to get some steam, but I definitely want to add more liquid just because I don't want anything to run dry and burn. So I'm taking, it's the same proportion. We're on low heat and things are getting steamy, um, but I do want to add more liquid, even if that means we lose 
some more of our speckly uh, areas. I'm taking some water that is the same four tablespoons of vinegar to eight cups of water proportion, and I'm adding it around the edge uh, because I want, and now I'm, as I'm doing this, I'm increasing the heat, but I want to get to a point where we can see, actually, I'm gonna reduce the heat again. I don't like <laughs> all this like trapped steam coming up, ooh, but if I move that, I don't wanna move the dye out of the middle too much, but I am just wanting to increase the liquid so that way we don't want anything to dry out, we don't want anything to burn. <laughs> um, I'm seeing some like purpley notes and actually, a lot more blue. Wow, okay. I think that this is based on where it's heated, but some color is shifting a lot uh, because of heat. I'm turning up the heat to high, mainly because the heat will be on a little bit of a bigger area. Ooh, I think I need to shift the white balance. Maybe that's a little bit better. Um, I am noticing some blue pigments. I don't love how much this is steaming here. Not that I want to like shock the fibers or anything, but I just, you know what I could do? I put the heat back down on low. I can try to make some like pockets where like air can, steam can escape. Maybe that'll help a bit because what I don't want, I don't want too much bubbling, but the reason why I'm raising the heat um, for a little bit as I continue to sort of baste <laughs> the edges here is that I want uh, the heat to be able to spread and when it's on high the heat is accessible for more of the pan. But now I'm going to reduce the heat to low and uh, I think I'm going to cover it. I'm gonna get some tin foil and cover this. So we're gonna say goodbye for a moment, but because I want the heat on low, but I want heat to get to all of the fiber, covering it will help trap some of that steam in there so things won't dry out, but also it'll trap the heat so things can stay nice and warm. You can buy covers for steam pans like this. I don't happen to own one, but that is something that you definitely could do. But anyway, and I'm sorry, you're looking at a very exciting <laughs> image of a foil right now. Uh, but I'm gonna let this sit for 30 minutes. I will check in on it every once in a while. It is even nice and steamy after me just sitting here. Um, but I'm going to let this heat for 30 minutes and then we'll check back in. After 30 minutes, I am done steam setting our yarn mop. Ooh. See a little bit more blue in here as well, but I'm gonna also let this cool completely so I can wash it. It has been 30 minutes, and wow, I am shocked with the blue. Oh my goodness, I don't think it's reading on camera necessarily, but I'm seeing like pops of blue. I wonder if that's from the pistachio which was reading extremely yellow originally on the yarn. But let's look. All right, I see like a hint of some pink, but otherwise, it looks like most of the color has absorbed, which is awesome. So I'm going to turn off the heat and I want this to cool. I do wanna let it cool for at least a bit before we move it, but I also want to just appreciate that we still have some really nice speckles here on the silk. Once I go ahead and wash it, uh, I expect that these, as the fiber moves a little bit, these will spread just because there's nothing, there's no twist to keep these where they are located. Uh, and there are some in the wall of the Andes as well. There's fewer, we see a lot more spread and blending over there, but they do exist. So I'm very curious with how these will look once uh, things dry off. But anyway, I am going to remove this from the heat to let it cool 
a bit so that way once it gets like less hot then I can remo I'll remove it from the pan to finish cooling so then we can wash it. Things are still a hair warm but I am going to remove it to wash. I am seeing some white patches here on the gloss and I am not whoa look at that depth of color though oh goody I see some speckles on the bottom side too but I think that while we may have some pastel patches I'm not expecting white hair but I did want to show that all the color has absorbed and so once everything is cool then we'll start washing actually there is a tiny bit of yellow left in here I don't know if there was some powder that just rinsed off while I was getting that or if we'll see some yellow come out when we wash it. Let's start out by washing our yarn mop, which is very springy. Ooh, it looks like the moss green breaks. Like we've got a blue in the center and then a lighter green going towards the outside. That is so pretty. So, so pretty. Oh my goodness. So while this was not the best yarn mop in that uh, it was not very good at mopping the dye off of my fingertips. The colorway is gorgeous. And so I would happily play around with this technique on non-superwash more, but I would do it in the intentional way that I've done sometimes, where I have the dyes out and then take little bits and use my fingertips, not worrying about my fingers drying in between. But we're not seeing any color bleeding, which is great. This colorway feels extremely vintage. Uh, I'm really excited about it. And I'm excited for you to see how the roving is looking too. Um, but I'm gonna finish rinsing out the soap. Stick, I'll stick it in the spin dryer uh, to wait and then we'll start rinsing the roving. The roving is so pretty. I love these more bluish hints that we get in here. And in some places it almost looks like a little bit burnt orange. It's really cool. I filled the basin with cold water and then I'm just gonna add the fiber in and we're gonna let it soak a bit. Ooh, is this the, this one I think is the silk. Yeah, I do see some white patches in there. Uh, our other I think has probably a lot less, but what I don't see is really bleeding. It's looking a little bit cloudy, but that's something that you see with some fibers sometimes. So I don't think that that's necessarily dye coming out. I am trying to be very, very gentle. And we're gonna add just a little bit of some dish soap in here trying to keep the water running towards away from the fiber. I don't want to move it around too much. This is the part that always makes me so incredibly nervous. <laughs> I don't like it. And now I'm like, oh no, did I use too much soap? But I'm gonna fill this up all the way and then sort of just gently help the fiber sort of exist in here. And I'm going to let it soak for a few minutes. Not because we're seeing color bleeding, because I'm not. Just because if there is color that isn't bound, you wouldn't want any, any color to come off on your fingers as you're spinning or anything. Not that a good wash can prevent crocking. Crocking is the phenomenon sometimes where you can have well washed fiber or yarn, but then you might see some color start to rub off on your fingers. And some amount of that is skin chemistry or lotions and pH and things like that. But sometimes it could be, I suppose, excess dye in your fiber. So I, I guess that is something to consider. But anyway, I'm just gonna let it soak for a few minutes. It's probably been a little more than a few minutes, but I am not seeing any color in the water. So that is great. And as I'm removing the liquid, I'm not squeezing the yarn. I'm just letting gravity do its thing. And so now I'm gonna fill this up again, let it soak for a minute or two to just rinse out the soap. But then we'll take the fiber and I'll put it through my spin dryer to spin out a lot of the liquid and hang it up 
to dry. But ooh, Stephanie, I'm excited. Here we have the dry roving with our Wool of the Andes that is 100% Peruvian Highland wool and our gloss, which is 70% merino, 30% silk. And the results are really, really cool. I think that ultimately at this stage, the amount of saturation between the tool feels a little similar with maybe a hair darker on the Wool of the Andes. But when we were dyeing it, the colors seemed to strike a little bit faster and feel brighter on the silk. Silk tends to lighten multiple shades once it dries because I think that the silk fibers are a little bit more translucent once they when they're wet and so that's why the difference between wet and dry is more dramatic. But I think the reason why the saturation feels similar is that we have a lot of color spread here in the Wool of the Andes. But in the silk, I think that it struck faster and we might have more white left over here than we do in our wool where the colors kind of go through all the way here and then here we feel some just more white sections and so that is so different from what I expected and so awesome. Mixing the pinks and greens we didn't get a lot of brown. There are a few areas that feel a little bit more rust but that increases the floral vibes that we have here. The like vintage floral napkin or wallpaper vibes in the color that I think is really, really pretty. And I love this. There are still feel, you can feel a little bit of speckles on the silk, but ultimately I like these tiny sections of color because when you draft and spin, it's going to spread out and give some really cool shifts in the pink and more green sections. Well, ultimately it depends on how you spin it. Like if you draft more, the colors will blend more. If you sort of pull it apart, so therefore you're drafting a little less, then you might have some shorter sections of color. And that's what's really fun about dyeing roving. If I were to send 10 different spinners the exact same colorway, you know, if I could get dupes of each of them and they would be exactly the same, they could create 10 completely different types of yarn. Just like a finished yarn in the hands of 10 knitters or weavers, you could end up with something very, very different feeling. Uh, the starting from the fiber, you still have so many possibilities and directions you can go with the yarn. And that's one reason why I really love dyeing fiber, even if it terrifies me a little bit. The fiber came out like super, super fluffy. Like I have not, I mean, this is me going in and fluffing it a little bit and it doesn't really need it. I would say that maybe there's a little bit of some surface area, but this is gonna draft like so, so easily. And I'm always really happy when things don't come out like feeling flat and mega compressed, oof. But if you think about some of these like speckly areas, as soon as you even like move the fiber at all, they spread out. And so that's just something to think about. But I'm gonna go and just kind of crochet these up so it looks neat. <laughs> the wool of the Andes also is like really, really just like fluffy. Um, maybe a few patches where there's a little bit surface uh, I, I don't think there's any way around it. If you dye a lot of fiber and have any tips, let me know. But I always just sort of like give a tiny little fluff just to remove some of the, uh, I mean, it's almost blocking, but where it's on the, the drying rack, just to kind of remove some of that crimp, I guess is the word. But yeah, this is very fluffy. I like the results of doing the cold process. I think that was really nice. Stephanie Gross, thank you so much for being my lab partner for this episode of Dye Pot Weekly. I love the way that this came together and I am so excited by this fiber. Uh, but, and even now, like, look at those little speckles. That's really, really cool. Really cool. And I still am so impressed 
that it stayed on the silk. That's not what I expected. But that's why I like to dye different bases fiber contents side by side because sometimes you'll see how one technique can behave differently because of the fiber content. And the more you do that in play, the more you know, so then you can try to get effects that you want on your fiber. Stephanie, I am going to send you the silk blend. I think that that is my favorite with how things came together today. I am so proud of this. I think that it'll spin up into something really beautiful and I really hope you will enjoy it. And so thank you again for being my lab partner. Dye Boat Weekly Lab Partners can pick from a list of different yarn bases or fiber contents that I have, and then I will design and film a video with you in mind. Uh, if you're interested in a yarn base that I don't have listed, uh, feel free to send me a message first because I do have a lot of other bare fiber and yarn at my disposal, just not necessarily enough to always have that on hand. So feel free to reach out and chat with me uh, on Etsy and we can pick a base that is what you would like to see me dye. There is also a last minute lab partner listing where I've already started filming the video and you can go and get like a hint of what the dyeing project and the final colors will be and so you can become a lab partner for one of those. The main difference is that I will film your shout outs after I have already filmed the rest of the video. There will be links to both of these types of listings down in the video description. I was so excited about the fiber, I almost forgot about the yarn mop. Using non-superwash yarn for the yarn mop, again, like wasn't as useful for getting the color off of my gloves, but as a technique, doing something like that to try to create a colorway that's random without the color spreading too far on yarn is really, really cool. And I really like how this turned out. I mean, that's some really pretty yarn. Each time I dye fiber, I'm like, man, I want to dye some more fiber. Man, I love this. But then each time I start, I get so nervous. And I don't know if this happens to anyone else, just because maybe it's because I feel like my skills as a knitter are way higher than my skills as a spinner. And so therefore, I feel like I'm much more qualified to judge like, ooh, this yarn is in really, really great shape. Whereas when it comes to fiber, I feel like if someone, I don't know, I just worry more about the quality of it and it's not something that I am quite as comfortable with. Even though I love spinning my hand dyed fiber a lot. So I don't know if that's making any sense, but I just, I hope that it's useful for me to share that there are things that make me nervous <laughs> when it comes to dyeing because I have filmed a lot of videos, I have done a lot of dyeing projects, but there are still things that I'm like, ooh, I don't really necessarily know how this is gonna go, but I can say I really like how this turned out. And while like speckles weren't necessarily the goal, they would be like a happy side effect, I think that doing a cold process of the color in a pan before heating it is something I would like to do a lot more of in the future when it comes to roving because then I'm not worrying about trying to flip hot fiber and things like that. So anyway, please leave suggestions for other roving videos you would like to see me do down in the comments below. I am Rebecca from Chemnitz and thank you so much for watching.